Hello everybody. So today's lecture is on herbicide use and safety. And so uh, the first place we're going to start off with is just trying to get people comfortable with the idea of uh, what are herbicides and and um, how do they get used. Uh, we'll go into different parts like uh, categories, treatments, application methods, safety, and planning to just kind of um, give us a good overview of herbicides and then in lab uh, this week what we'll do is work over some calculations for how do we how do we mix herbicides and and then um, prepare them for use so uh, just to begin herbicides are chemicals that are used to control unwanted plants and so specifically it's an herbicide because it's um, being used against plants. If it was a pesticide, it'd be um, used against uh, pests, insecticide, chemical used against insects. So herbicides are specifically chemicals used to control unwanted plants. And so this can be seen in an agricultural setting, in uh, residential or urban settings, forestry uh, and range settings, industrial sites, uh, railroads, and, and other places. Um, herbicides, uh, prescribed fire, which we'll talk about, and then um, some, some machinery are cost-effective tools for managing uh, forest vegetation. So why would we use herbicides? We'd want to do things like increase the timber value, enhance the wildlife habitat by getting rid of undesirable species, try and restore native ecosystems that maybe have been taken over by um, exotic and invasive species, improve the aesthetics, the, the actual just look of the place, um, reducing wildfire hazard, and then managing invasive plants as well. So um, you kind of, you'll hear a terminology sometimes, uh, herbaceous weed control or HWC. Uh, and what that's referring to is the idea of using herbicides to control or eliminate uh, weeds, grasses, or other non-woody vegetation. And so that is vital for um, the establishment of tree seedlings. So when we're doing artificial regeneration with trees and we're out there planting trees, we want uh, we know that uh, the trees that we're planting, mostly uh, softwood conifer trees, are shade intolerant trees. They don't like to have competition. They like to have a lot of full sunlight and come up. And so in order to do that, when they're really, really small, we want to make sure that we create an environment that allows for successful establishment. And we will do that by being able to use herbicides to get rid of the weeds and the grasses. Can those trees come up still with weeds and grasses? Sure. But the idea that they're going to come up all the same and perfect and the way that we want them to probably not and that's where um, herbaceous weed control comes in uh, and if we're looking at the silvicultural cycle that's in the site prep um, and the establishment phase of the silvicultural cycle there's also um, woody control so it can be herbaceous woody control or sometimes called release so you use herbicide to control the competing woody stem trees and shrubs that might inhibit the growth of the younger trees. So if we have a forest setting and um, maybe you're still growing those artificially regenerated conifers, but then um, some oaks and some sweet gums and some other hardwood trees are, are trying to come up and trying to get into the canopy. So you could use herbicides to, to get, those, um, get those seedlings out of there and be able to basically release the the other trees from competition and so those are two two main uses that we have uh, in terms of when we're going to be using herbicides so the situations that really require herbicides things where we're really going to make sure um, or things that we're really going to need herbicides for site preparation for regenerating the the artificial seedlings and if we're specifically using herbicides, it'd be called chemical site prep, uh, where we're basically just making sure that we have this uh, the ground that is perfectly set up for our shade intolerant species. Uh, another situation would be eliminating the competing vegetation. 
uh, alongside our newly established uh, tree seedlings that release from before where we're basically trying to fit trying to get rid of all the competing uh, other woody vegetation or other trees that are trying to prevent um, our desired species from establishing themselves. And then reducing understory vegetation in an established stand of timber. And that uh, becomes important uh, if we're trying to really manage the stand. So if we're going to be bringing equipment into the stand or we're going to have people coming through the stand it's it's important in terms of trying to reduce that understory vegetation that um does not always happen or is um, not always necessary because um in reducing that vegetation sometimes you can eliminate wildlife habitat and um also um kind of set up situations where the ecosystem isn't as healthy as it could be but also depending on how uh how much of a commercial operation you have and and or how much the um those trees are worth to you it might be worth your time to do that because um that might um prevent uh something like wildfire hazard from happening because you don't have any ladder fuels or any other um fuels to to create a problem but the biggest use in my mind of um, herbicides uh, besides site preparation is going to be controlling invasive or noxious or exotic plants because those are are a problem everywhere in kind of everywhere in the world in terms of forests but definitely here in the united states are quite a quite a problem so here's an example of that last um, that last part, the controlling invasive noxious or exotic plants. So this individual here is spot treating some invasive milk thistle, which is it's a weed uh, on Catalina Island, uh, and he's using a backpack sprayer. And you can see, so here's the backpack, here's the little wand, and he's spraying out here trying to um, control all these stems here are all all invasive species. So what are some types of herbicides? So when you see something like this and it says Velpar and it says herbicide, what what are we talking about here? And so this, I pulled this from this forest herbicides characteristics uh, paper from the University of Florida. And it's just, here are some examples of the herbicide. And what you'll see is you'll see the active ingredient listed and then the trade name, so the common name that you'd see on the um, on the front of the bottle. And then uh, it tells you the herbicide family, the mode of action. So where is it going to um, affect the plant? How is it going to affect the plant? Like for hexazinone, right here it says it's a photosynthesis inhibitor. So what hexazinone does is when you spray uh, hexazinone on a plant um, or put it into the soil around the plant what it's going to do is it's going to prevent uh, it's going to get into the leaves basically and prevent photosynthesis from happening and so that's what it means by mode of action uh, for something like um, 2,4-D here it's a growth regulator so it's just basically going to keep the plant from growing and that's the way it's going to to stop stop that plant you also have the selectivity, so um, what is it that you're trying to stop? So um, looking back at 2,4-D, annual and perennial broadleaf uh, woody plants. If we look at hexazinone, uh, annual and perennial broadleaf uh, and grasses and woody plants. And then the activity, so where is it working? So um, foliar or soil or foliar and soil. And so let's let's break it down and um, try and make it easier than just here's a bunch of um, herbicides listed in a chart. So herbicides are going to fall into two basic categories. There's going to be pre-emergent pre and post-emergent. And what we're talking about is um, what what the plant is doing. So pre-emergent, so you apply it to the soil before the unwanted vegetation can germinate. And so it's the the herbicide is formulated to disrupt the germination process or it's going to kill it as the plant germinates. So basically it just prevents it 
um, from getting started before it starts. You also have post-emergent uh, herbicides. So that's applied to the foliage and or the soil and is used when the unwanted vegetation already exists. So pre-emergent, before it can come up and grow, post-emergent, it's already up and growing, but now we're going to try and, um, and get it uh, removed from the landscape. So I'm going to slide myself out of the way here. There I am. All right. And so then um, going back with what we were looking at, the active ingredient, that is the chemical substance in the herbicide that disrupts plant metabolism and produces the herbicidal effect. Or it's, it's, the, it's the chemical ingredient that is really the part of the herbicide that's trying to uh, eliminate the plant or inhibit the plant in some way. When looking at um, at an herbicide, the active ingredient is the primary factor for selecting that herbicide. Um, it can be referred to either by the common name or the chemical name. So uh, in this example, you have triclopyr, triclopyr uh, or you have um, for triclopyr, it's 356 triclo to acetic acid. Uh, so that's a little more complicated, and you can see why um, they came up with common names like triclopyr to try and uh, simplify it. But the active ingredient is the chemical in the product that's going to kill, control, or repel the, um, the plant in our case, since it's an herbicide. So with herbicides, there's two ways that, um, that herbicides can be activated in uh, vegetation, and that's foliar through the, the foliage or the leaves or soil activated. And so when it's foliar activated, the herbicide must make direct contact with the foliage to be activated. And this is most effective when applied during late summer and early fall. And that's the idea of when these trees are um, have finished growing and are kind of tired or a little, um, a little weak because they've spent all their year growing and then now you go and hit them with a foliar activated herbicide whereas a soil activated herbicide that's applied to the soil so that the plant's roots basically take it up like they would be taking up um, water or nutrients and then they end up taking up the the herbicide with it and so that's most effective um, when applied during late winter or during the spring basically right before things are about to get greened up right before this thing says all right i'm ready to grow i'm ready to kind of start again you hit it with the herbicide uh, and so then there are some herbicides that do both uh, foliar and soil um, at the same time so treatments so how do we actually um, deal with uh, the herbicide in terms of getting it on to these plants. So there's um, six um, specific uh, herbicide treatments used in forage management. There's broadcast, banded, injection, hack and squirt, cut surface, and then streamlined. So broadcast, an herbicide is applied to the entire area that's being treated. Banded, a type of broadcast treatment in which the herbicide is only applied with a narrow band, usually immediately along where tree seedlings are going to be or have been established. Uh, injection, so um, you're you're literally injecting herbicide into the the plant. Hack and squirt, usually with a hatchet, and what you do is you 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 hatch it into a smaller tree where it's real easy to sink a hatchet into. You open it up, and then you squirt the herbicide in, so it gets right into the into the heart of the tree. Cut surface, so you're gonna basically cut a tree, you got a stump there, and then um, you're going to apply it to the stump, which is something I've done um, quite a bit in terms of just things in my yard. And then streamline, a thin directed stream of herbicide to the outer bark of a small diameter tree. So what does this um, kind of look like? So I, there's a nice little picture here of people doing some cut surface treatments or some basal uh, bark streamline treatments or injections or 
you know, we are foliar activated versus our soil treatments and our um, cut surface uh, stump treatments. But um, I like this picture because it kind of shows a bunch of different things. But how does it actually look? It looks like this. So when we're talking about broadcast, um, what you'll see a lot uh, in um, areas where where it can be effective is using um, aerial sprays um, through a uh, helicopter or um, crop dusters is another way that you'll see that. Let me move myself down here. All right. And then, um, so that's broadcast banded. You can see specifically you get these little narrow bands that can go in between the rows. Um, this is an agricultural example, but you'll see this a lot in um, site prep and going between the rows of planted uh, pine trees. You've got the stem injection here um, happening where you, this needle, you've got the herbicide in here and the needle is going right into uh, or right through this uh, stem of this invasive species. Your hack and squirt where you just hacked around this tree and you're squirting the herbicide right in. Your cut surface treatment, so this blue colored stuff. Um, uh, one thing that's interesting to mention is that usually um, when you're uh, dealing with pesticides, or herbicides. Um, one thing that uh, people like to do is stick in a pretty uh, dark colored dye as part of the mix and then that way when you're spraying it you'll be able to see where you've sprayed so you know kind of how much you've um, you've um, had basically that you've that you've used. Obviously if you're broadcast spraying you're doing the brand banded you don't really need that but um, maybe for the hack and squirt or for the cut surface it makes sense to really put in that that blue dye to be able to see. And then the streamline, you can see also the same thing here. I'll slide myself out of the way a little bit, but you can see this darker color because they've got some, they've got some dye mixed into the tank. So you can see exactly how much and where you've sprayed. So you know, um, what you've sprayed and that way you, you don't waste a lot of pest, uh, pesticide or herbicide. So application methods. So how are we going to do this? So you can see in this picture here that you that this is a broadcast coming from this helicopter and it's just um, spraying quite a bit of herbicide, uh, which could lead to uh, a problem of drift. Uh, drift is the idea that the herbicide would end up in all sorts of different areas that it's not supposed to. And so with a broadcast spray like this, you're going to assume a certain amount of, of drift. But Basically, um, herbicides, we could get way more in-depth and we could get way more complicated, but we're going to just keep it very simple for this class and just go with, um, we've got our three application methods. So aerial, ground, or by hand. So aerial, um, more than likely by helicopter, not um, the planes and crop dusters are not used as much as helicopters are because you can get lower and much more um, kind of uh, much more precise with your with your spray uh, ground and when we're talking about on the ground we're talking about um, being mounted on a tractor crawler dozer ATV or a log skitter um, which is this example this would be ground application here with this um, this piece of machinery it looks like probably a, a skitter um, at some point um, that now has a uh, herbicide attachment on the back instead of the uh, the skidding equipment and then uh, by hand. Now in terms of what we have at, at BC and what you'll be able to do um, and what we'll kind of focus on is uh, is the hand application because um, we ha will have backpack tanks that will fill up with water and run through the calculations of um, active ingredients and kind of go through that that whole process uh, and so um, that's that'll be the application method we focus on here also because I don't have a helicopter and so uh, the backpack um, by the hand application this is what it'll look like you'll have some PPE on here he's got long sleeves gloves eye protection head protection boots and then he's got on his backpack which looks like this you basically have your mixing tank and you've got your wand and then there's usually some sort of a pump um, you've got a trigger on your wand and then a pump so that you can um, 
mix the uh, the herbicide, and usually it's the um, the wand in one hand and then the pump down in the other, so that you can continually spray and walk at the same time. Um, one of the things I would say in terms of what's happening here is hopefully he's not um, not spraying because you want to you don't want to spray very high up because you want to you don't want to have that pesticide or herbicide drift towards you so you want to kind of spray and keep the the wand lower um, pretty much if you can hip high but sometimes um, I'm willing to bet this is probably down in the south somewhere and you get these larger um, larger vegetation that you might have to if it's a foliar activated uh, herbicide that you're spraying you've got to make sure you hit the leaves so that's where it gets tricky So uh, right here, I'd encourage you to pause this video and then watch this um, this clip from Oregon State about backpack sprayer operations, and then um, just come back. But basically, here's the idea of um, this uh, this individual is spraying using the backpack that we just talked about, and you can see the spray that comes out, and you can. There's, you'll have a nozzle and you can turn the nozzle and get either a wider spray or a narrower spray. Similar to anybody who's ever used a garden hose, it's a similar operation. The only difference is that um, on the left hand side here, he's got that pump because he's needs to, to pump to, to help mix the, um, the, the herbicide uh, in the tank. And then um, the other the other big part of it is, uh, making sure that we get our mix right. So you can see right here we've got this Spartan herbicide. It's got the active ingredient here of sulfentrazone. And then, um, but then it also talks about, it says four pounds of active ingredient per gallon. And so um, when you when you read something like that, that means the other things that, it, that the active ingredient is being mixed in. So we got to make sure that we get our mix correct when we're going to when we're going to do these applications. And so that takes us into the safe use of herbicides because we've got to make sure that we're going to do it correctly because it is something that can be harmful. It's harmful to the plants and it could be harmful to us, but if we do it correctly and we follow all the instructions that we should, we should be able to operate uh, herbicides and the equipment safely. And so um, some of the, the easy things to think about, exercise caution at all times, read and understand the product labels because there's quite a bit of information in there, practice good personal hygiene by washing your hands, which is extremely important at this time anyways, wear appropriate personal protective equipment, and wear it whenever necessary. So um, don't just think, well, when I'm spraying, I've got to put on the personal protective equipment. Wear it anytime you are dealing with the herbicide and then take care and maintain uh, your application equipment. So for us, if we're focusing on the idea of the backpack sprayers, making sure that the backpacks are working at all times, the nozzle is clean, there's no dirt or anything else getting in there, our tanks have been um, mixed properly and um, also that they've been cleaned properly and every single time and that they fit on our ourselves well and that um, there's no leaks or anything else happening and we really want to make sure we take care of our equipment. But the big the big one for me and the big one that I'm a stickler on is personal protective equipment. So making sure that we're using personal protective equipment at all times because it it, it exists for our own safety and it exists to make sure that we stay healthy even though we're dealing with chemicals that can be harmful to us. And so just here's a couple um, couple graphics to kind of show the idea. Most of the stuff we uh, will have, we won't have to be using a respirator that you see on the right-hand side, but there are some chemicals that you may have to do that. But you definitely want long sleeves. You want chemical-resistant gloves. You want protective eyewear. Uh, you definitely want to have uh, shoes and socks and long pants. Basically, you want to... Um, one thing you're going to have to read the label and really know what um, what is this pesticide or herbicide and what 
how does it how can it affect human beings can it get in the skin easily um can it get um through orifices easily like your ears and your eyes those sorts of things uh your mouth and so you really want to make sure to know how can how can whatever herbicide you're using hurt you and then make sure that you have donned personal protective equipment to prevent that from happening and so you really want to protect your hot spots too so this map here kind of shows the different hot spots of where people uh, have been hurt. So it's it says percents indicate relative amount of absorption of pesticide over a 24-hour period. So these are the places where you get it a lot. And so you can see that the, the genitalia is one of them. So what that tells me is that people are doing things like taking off their their um, gloves to go to the bathroom and then not thinking about what, having washed their hands or done any of that to make sure that they're not exposing um, any parts of themselves to these pesticides. So you really want to think about things like, um, you know, oh, well, I took off my my glasses for a minute or I took off my my hat or helmet or my earplugs or whatever it is and then not not making sure that your hands are washed properly not making sure that you've uh, cleaned off your clothing properly and then you end up having problems with um, with the pesticides. Uh, really in terms of the clothing you want to just kind of leave yourself as little exposed as possible so if you have on long sleeves uh, and long pants there's not a lot of skin exposed if you have on gloves then your hands are are covered up as well, and there's nothing exposed on your chest or um, or on your legs. And then if you've got socks and shoes, now there's no exposure except for anything above the neck. And then for that, maybe we want to wear a mask, maybe we want to wear glasses, earplugs, a hat, all these things that could whatever we can do to cover ourselves up as much as possible and make it safe. Uh, more than likely your uh, work will supply you with some of these things, but your work may not um, require things like um, long sleeves uh, when you're playing herbicides or um, ear protection. But those are the things that if you read through the, uh, the, the sheet that comes with the herbicide and read the label, you'll know what, um, what, how, how it's harmful to human beings and what you'll need to do to protect yourself against that harm. And then that way you'll know what PPE you specifically need for the job you're trying to do. So I've talked about the label before, and I think it's a really big part in um, safety is I see, oops, let me go back real quick. I see a label like this, and how do I know what to read? Well, uh, they try and make it, pretty obvious. Uh, we know, based on what we talked about before, the idea of the active ingredient being something that's important for us to understand. So in this case, it's glyphosate. And you can see down there that tells you how much glyphosate. So 41% of the, the Roundup herbicide is glyphosate. And then other ingredients um, like the surfactants and other things that are going to make it um, stick to the surface that it's being put on make up the rest. And then right here, personal protective equipment, applicators and other handlers must wear long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes plus socks. And then, um, so it tells you exactly what you need to, to prevent yourself and it all, uh, prevent yourself from having a problem. And it also tells you first aid, um, if you get it in your eyes, what you should do. So there's a lot of information on these labels, but, um, one of the big things I want to go over is um, the idea of lethal dose and then the idea of the signal words on these labels. So uh, lethal dose, that is the amount of chemical that will kill 50% of a test population. Um, according to the, the, the Florida University of Florida handout, um, the test population for uh, the majority of these herbicides was uh, rabbits and rats, I believe. Um, but so when we're talking about lethal dose, it it's the amount of chemical that will kill 50% of a population. And so in terms of our herbicides, if you see LD50, that means it's the 
uh, dose or quantity of an herbicide that kills 50 or more of a test, test population of animals through oral or dermal exposure. So just putting this uh, chemical on their skin or having them ingest this chemical, that is the amount that will kill 50% of a test population. If you see LC50 on it, it's the herbicide concentration in the air. So just the idea of being around it and inhaling it or being in the water with it, um, that will kill 50% of the test population of animals. And so um, just to try and get yourself used to, uh, if you see no label, um, your LD50 is going to be greater than 5 grams per kilogram. If you see caution, 0 0.5 to, to 5 grams, warning 50 to 500 milligrams per kilogram, and danger will be uh, poison greater, um, equal to uh, or less than 50 milligrams per kilogram. So when you see this right here, they've got different um, different shapes for the different words. And then also the idea of poison, corrosive, flammable, explosive. There's all sorts of different uh, labels that will be put on these things. But the one I really want to focus on are these signal words, the danger, warning, and caution. So the LD50 values specifically won't always be given, but what will be given is the signal word. So in this uh, touchdown herbicide on the left here, the signal word here is caution. And caution is greater than, um, greater than 500 in this case. And so when we're talking about that, it's the relative toxicity of a pesticide product um, being reflected by one of these three words. And you've got danger, warning, and caution. Okay. If you, if you see these, what they're doing is they are alerting the user to the, the level of toxicity. So what you want to think about is the idea that danger is really bad, caution is not as bad. And the way you want to think about it is looking at these values here. So the idea that you have um, greater than 500, uh, greater than 500 in terms of your, your LD50. So it means it takes a lot to kill 50% of that test population. Whereas if you have the word danger here and you've got 0 to 50, that means that you're talking about just a little bit, even just any of it, can kill 50% of that test population, which means it's very bad for you. So if you see caution, it's you, you have to have caution. You have to um, really make sure you're, you're being safe, but it's the least, uh, least dangerous of the three danger by far being the worst because of the idea that um, smaller amounts will kill half of a test population it means that just any of it could be really really harmful to you uh, and then those those words are generally assigned based on the pesticides uh, inhalation oral or dermal toxicity which uh, whichever is most toxic for um, the specific pesticide or herbicide and that's what we talked about on the last slide and so in looking at a table from that, um, from that article uh, from the University of Florida, so you can see here's uh, our active ingredients. So we got the 2,4-D, uh, we've got glyphosate, which is that roundup um, that we looked at a little bit, and we got hexazinone, which I talked about earlier. And so they show the toxicity, uh, the oral and the dermal toxicity for oral, they apparently tested it on rats, and for the dermal, they tested it on rabbits. And so you can see those amounts are pretty high um, for for most of these. It gets um, gets a little bit closer in terms of 2,4-D. So 2,4-D is is a pretty um, is is definitely much much worse uh, for you than something like glyphosate or or hexazinone would be. And then um, this, there's also environmental and safety concerns listed on this table. And you can see really with 2,4-D, especially the, the salt formation, you don't want to get it near your eyes. And so um, 
There's also uh, categories that you might see in terms of category one, category two, category three, category four, and those have the, the signal words with them. So category one um, herbicides, really, really bad for you, really things that you really want to make sure that your PPE is not only on, but is uh, working and is really good because these are the these are chemicals uh, or these are herbicides in in category one that have chemicals that are really really bad for you so you can see that um, for ear irritation it might be a irreversible destruction of ocular tissue and for the skin tissue destruction into the dermis and or scarring so really really bad for you whereas um, category two category three category four um, not as bad for you. Category four, minimal effects, uh, clearing in less than 24 hours. So that's not, not as bad as irreversible destruction of your ocular tissue. So you really want to make sure you read these labels, you see these words, you understand, uh, what they mean. Uh, so here's another spot where you can hit pause in the lecture and um, use the slides and look up this YouTube video on on how to do cleaning uh, for our our herbicide operations. But we've got some basic applicator safety tips. Uh, so when just when handling herbicides on site, you want to always follow your PPE precautions and have them going have PPE on even when just mixing the herbicides before even using them. Um, beware of all mixing requirements and procedures indicated on the label and make sure we're doing that correctly, which is what we're gonna do in lab um, for herbicides. You wanna keep the containers below eye level when opening or pouring, and we don't want to, uh, we don't wanna really be looking straight down into it because we know that when you mix um, chemicals together you can get splash effect especially if we're pouring things in so you don't want to be standing there pouring and looking straight in and basically setting yourself up um, for for problems by being in the splash zone so you want to keep it as far away from you as you can while still doing it um, safely and smartly uh, you want to keep fill hoses above uh, water level you don't want to stick the hose into into the mixture and then you want to also be aware of the wind direction uh, when you're pouring and um, to minimize your your exposure and then the last kind of just idea of the basics of herbicides is planning so what goes into the idea of planning and and what things do you want to see there so in this uh, herbicide prescription here they've got a five-step process so you want to look at the amount of parent chem chemical per acre for each herbicide recommended to meet the prescription you want to select uh, one of the products of your choice from the list for each chemical and then determine the rates you need you want to select a surfactant to add to the mix you want to take note of the proper timing for the herbicide application and you want to select an application method so lots that go into it. So how are we going to make these decisions? Well, um, the big thing is that herbicide prescriptions should definitely be de developed by forestry or herbicide professional who's got uh, expertise in the use and application of it. And then the other things we really want to consider. So the species, specifically the species that we're trying to treat, the density and the size of those species, as well as the layout. How what are we talking about? If we're talking about 10,000 acres or 100 acres or two acres or a few spots here and there, those are the type of things that are really going to be important in determining what herbicide gets used. The presence or absence of trees or plants that are uh, to remain intact afterwards because the whole idea of doing something like our herbicide application is we have a desired species that we're really trying to help and promote. And so we really want to make sure that whatever we're using is not going to affect that desired species in any negative way. The soil type and soil conditions at the time of our herbicide application are extremely important. And then the type of herbicide that's going to be applied, the treatment and the application method that we're going to use. And then um, I would also 
uh, throw in there just the idea of do we really need herbicide for what we're trying to accomplish? And that goes into um, the ideas of integrated pest management and um, are there other ways of controlling these plants um, that might be interfering with our desirable plants before having to use herbicides to make sure that the idea that we are using herbicides is because we have to use herbicides and there isn't a better way to do it that doesn't involve chemicals. And so uh, here's just an example from the Department of Resources of Natural Resources, Forest Resources Division in Michigan of what a pesticide application plan looks like for them. So um, you got kind of your basics here, but first thing uh, on the list is what pesticide are you using, how many acres, the treatment purpose, your specific objectives, your evaluation of need, um, your target species and how much are they, the soil type, habitat type, uh, any special considerations. Um, also important here when talking about the soil habitat type, they've got a depth to water table um, so that we know is, is this something that might um, get into groundwater or might affect water that we have to really think about and, and make sure um, that we're doing something that won't cause other people problems. So continuing on with um, this example um, application plan, you can see the chemicals um, prescribed and they go with the tray name and they want to see your formulation and your dose and your estimated uh, cost. They want to know who is going to be the applicator, the, the cost, um, if there's any uh, Ford Stewardship, Forest Stewardship Council, FFC, derogated, der derogated products proposed, what is your application method, uh, what's your planned application uh, time, and then any environmental uh, safety risks or precautions that need to be taken care of. And then uh, the end of their application, uh, how are you going to notify the public of what's happening, any comments, attaching a map, and then you have to sign off on it. So there's a lot of information that needs to go into a plan uh, to do herbicides because uh, going with um, what we've talked about in terms of integrated pest management in, in other classes is the idea that chemicals should be used um, as kind of the last resort and that there's other ways to do it. So this application really goes into that idea of is have you looked at the other stuff and have you planned this well enough because this is supposed to be that kind of that last step. So we really want to make sure if we're going to do this and we're going to put chemicals into the environment that we've thought about it, we know exactly what we're doing, we know why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and the way we're going to do it so that we do it right and we don't cause any problems, um, any more problems than we already had. And that's kind of the, the basics uh, for herbicides. So um, if you have any questions, like always, uh, contact me and uh, see you next time.